All right, so here we go. This is our second uh, lesson on Leviticus. Um, and we come to this part of Leviticus, and, and we're starting to get that obedience is a theme, right? Obedience is a very strange thing in life. It's, it's kind of like we know that it's good for us. You know, we know that obedience is very important, and yet we don't really like it. <laughs> So we like it so much, and dislike it so much as a culture, we've actually taken it out of our marriage vows, right? We don't say obey anymore. Um, but we, because we don't naturally want to obey people. Um, and we know that that's a battle anyone that's had a two-year-old knows, <laughs> or three-year-old, <laughs> whenever they hit the terrible twos, um, that, that it's a battle, right? But we do, but obedience, but, but rules are good for us. And, you know, we, we obey the rules of the road, and those are for our safety, right, and for the safety of others. Um, we have laws in our society that help us to, uh, to be safe, to protect our, our person, to protect our, 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 our property, to protect our livelihood. So, so laws and obeying the laws are good, good for society to function and good for our happiness. Um, Amber, just the other day, we were at the office, uh, Jeff's office, and she runs out the back door and she runs right into the parking lot but it was around a blind curve so if somebody was coming around i just it just scared me to death and i thought amber she doesn't like to obey my rules but she's got to hold my hand when we leave the she can't dart into the you guys know the little ones but they don't like to uh to to obey mom and dad right um anybody that's ever had a puppy knows that doggy training is a very important thing <laughs> it helps the family function well helps mom to be happy, right? We don't want the puppies chewing things up and throwing it up, right? <laughs> so, uh, so obedience is good, but we do. We have a mixed uh, a view of obedience, and we know it's for our good, and we know it keeps us safe, um, but we don't really like it in our nature, and we carry that mentality into our, our relationship with God, unfortunately. But uh, Dr. Laura, I don't know where she's at with the Lord, uh, but she, she had a very interesting quote. She said, we gain character with our decision to obey, despite our limited ability to understand. So we know that we obey God because we know that he knows what's best for us. We know that he always has our best interest in mind. We know that he's all wise, he's all knowing, he knows the future, and we don't. And we trust that 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 everything that 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 we are in his sovereign hands and that everything that happens uh, is in our in our best interest. We trust that God knows best. Can you repeat that? Oh certainly. We gain character. Uh, yep, so oh, her quote was we gain character with our decision to obey despite our limited ability to understand. Thank you. Sure, sure. And sometimes when we obey God, um, it, it's to protect us. You know, I, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised at the number of times that things may have come our way if we weren't obedient, um, would have been probably harmful for us. Um, and even, you know, when we pray, and, and I, I tell my kids, you know, all the time, because, you know, they pray for things with God, and sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, we obey anyway, right? <laughs> and but we, I'm teaching my kid, children that no's are a good thing. We are thankful to God for no's, because as I get older, and I see where God has said no to me, I, I am very thankful mm. that my life went down the path that it's, it's gone down and not potentially something that wouldn't be good for me. So obedience, it's not... It's not a feeling, right? We don't always feel like obeying. It's a decision of the will. Like we do have to make a decision um, to obey. And because in God's economy, um, obedience is, a heart, is at the heart of his creation, his creative order. Uh, when we obey God, we're aligning our hearts with his hearts and, um, and our wills with his will, and we're getting on board with his purposes. And, um, and there's always blessing in that. Right? We always know that, that it doesn't we don't feel like obeying, but when we do something for God afterwards, we're so, we're so often so glad and so blessed we did. Um, God uses our obedience as a way of drawing us closer to him. He uses our obedience, um, like Dr. Laura said, to, to increase our character, to make us more like Christ. Um, life tends to run smoother. Jeff said, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when you, you're, you're, you, you, you go to the mechanic and take your car in every so often, 
uh, to tweak it, to repair, not just to repair it, but to, you know, that, that ordinary maintenance. Because if you don't change your oil every so many thousand miles, you're going to have problems. So we obey God. Um, life goes smoother. It's not, that means, doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. Um, but when we're aligned with God's purposes, we're on God's, we're on God's road, uh, track that he has for us. And that, that road I kind of look at is like, like that, the track is the, his obedience. Um, it really does. Life does uh, run smoother. It's not that it's perfect, but we know when we're in his will and we're aligned with his heart, we have, we experience his presence. Uh, we have a, the ability to experience his presence more and that brings peace. It brings peace. Uh, joy it brings power no matter what our circumstances so obeying God is good for us even if we don't feel like it we obey it brings it honors God it brings blessing it draws us closer to him builds our character um, and so all those good things um, that we feel afterwards right <laughs> uh, it doesn't we don't always feel it during the time or before but Leviticus as we're going through Leviticus we're seeing that it really is a book about uh, rituals and obeying rituals obeying the rules that God that God has set um, and um, in ritual in and of itself it's not you know really a bad thing I think we've shied away from it in the evangelical community um, but but ritual can teach us about God it can teach us about our faith and we do have ritual in our in our uh, in our religion we we, we, we we celebrate baptism it's a great ritual it's a joyful occasion um, it's not that we view baptism as not uh, our, our me means of salvation but it um, tells us something about God it's it's that symbolic and especially when you uh, when you dunk in the water and come out um, it's that that identification with Jesus that that in him dying and raising from the dead that we uh, symbolically die to self and we are raised to new life in Christ and we celebrate that that ritual um, as a, a way of also um, uh, uh, Jesus uh, also the water is that symbol of washing he's washed away our sin but we don't put our faith in the ritual right we put our faith in what the ritual represents that 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 just like uh, we don't live in a blueprint of our house we live in our house the house is the reality the blueprint represents the reality um, and so, so it is with rituals. And these rituals might seem strange to us. And like last week, we talked about all those ritual uh, uh, sacrifices. And what we really concluded was that Jesus was the house. Jesus was the ultimate reality, right? The ritual, the Levitical sacrifices were the blueprint. Um, they were the symbol of the real thing. So we, we, we come to uh, these, I'm going to actually move around a little bit. We're going to do uh, Leviticus 11 through 16 first, and then we're going to go back and hit on 8 through 10. I know you think I'm trying to avoid it because I missed it last week too. I'm really, it's very important. I'm going to get to it. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're going to get there. Um, but I, I, I think, I, I hope this makes sense in my thinking. In my thinking, it makes sense. I'll hopefully it'll come out right. Uh, but we're coming to uh, chapters 11 through 15, and I hope you were had, had a chance to read it um, um, because um, this was a way that I think that God is explaining to um, the people of Israel, of course, again, before Jesus, in the pre-Jesus days, and he's using the uh, symbols, he's using the, the, um, their diet, um, sex, their, your monthly period, um, skin diseases, mildew. We're, we're going to be talking about these things, um, and in 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 a in a way where God is building this contrast between um, His holiness and our not holiness. His He's clean. We're not clean. And um, and when I say things like like eating and sex and and our period you know those are good things it's not that there's anything morally wrong with those so please don't get me wrong it's not a bad it's not a moral it's not a moral sin thing it's a ritual uh ritual uncleanliness and i'm gonna talk about that more we're gonna take a little bit of a closer look but we have to keep in mind three things before we get into these chapters um first thing again god's teaching them that there's a huge difference between him and them god is holy Man is not, and so we're we're going to see this contrast, and God is having them distinguish between clean and unclean, and pure and and, and impure, and um, um, because what God is telling the people at this time is that purity is a requirement to be in His presence, um, that a holy God cannot dwell uh, with an unholy 
uh, people. And um, for us, now that we have Jesus, we are so grateful and so thankful for all the blessings that we have in Christ, the spiritual blessings in Christ. And I love Ephesians 1. Please read it. It's so awesome. All the truths of what's true of us when we're in Christ. And in fact, I read it again this morning, and I'm like, it, to me, it just comes across as Paul's so excited about who we are in Christ. It's like, it almost feels like, like one big run-on sentence. Like Paul's like, so excited about who we are in Christ, that we've been adopted, that we've been uh, forgiven, um, that we uh, that we have full access to God uh, through Jesus uh, because of his death on the cross, that we've been made holy, we've been declared righteousness, uh, righteous, uh, Jesus' righteousness on us, and we have the Holy Spirit, that, um, that little tiny glimpse of the reality of heaven uh, within us. Um, and so it, it's just so... Uh, it's so good, but the people, we have to keep in mind, the people um, uh, in this time, they didn't have Jesus, of course, uh, and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Uh, so God is using this system to, uh, to set up um, uh, uh, that contrast between holy God and, 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 and unholiness and how he was to draw them in closer to him. Um, Second thing we want to, uh, to to keep in mind is that um, that God was stressing to them that it was it's just as much important how you live outside of the sanctuary to God as how we live inside the sanctuary. So you know we know that principle, how, you know how you act and how you live your faith out uh, behind closed doors when nobody's looking is very important to God. Um, so again, that principle going back to we don't go to church, we are the church. We want to be good image bearers uh, 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 to the world and and before God because. We really do serve for an audience of one. So that's that's a good thing. So God's teaching them that. And then also, back in this day, there was no health department. So you're going to see the priests for the health department. <laughs> Disease was a problem. We have to keep in mind, right? That we have two million people, nomadic, moving around a dry desert, no running water. You know, no... Uh, it, it, there's so It seems strange to us in our modern day, but... Uh, we are very blessed <laughs> to live in this time, um, but for them, um, you know, God is 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 is, um, is setting up that uh, again that that He's using uncleanliness to demonstrate the fact that sin makes us unclean and sin makes us. So He's He's taking disease and mildew and you know and 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 parasites and you know things that can be harmful to our physical bodies and he's showing us that sin just like disease harms our physical bodies sin hurts harms our soul our our, our spirits and so um god's um uh, uh, uh setting that system up that they see that 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 just like uncleanliness separates them from society and separates them from coming close to god in the tabernacle that also sin separates us from God, right? It it um, hurts our relationships here on earth, right? Um, it causes emotional turmoil. It causes mental confusion. Um, so, and ultimately, uh, if we die in our sin, separates us etern eternally from God. But thank God for Jesus that we know uh, that uh, we nothing on this earth can ever separate us from God. And we know that from Romans 8, uh, well, we know that from the whole, most of Scripture, but Romans 8, 38, 39, Paul's pretty clear about it. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor this present, nor the future, nor any power, or height, or depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, praise the Lord, nothing on earth here can separate, or beyond the earth, can separate us from Jesus. There is no shunning us from God's camp uh, once we are in Christ. So how wonderful that is. Um, so we're going to start with Leviticus chapter 11. And Leviticus chapter 11 is really all about the clean and the unclean uh, for food, for their dietary, uh, their dietary purposes. Um, so we read through it, and you read through, and you know that um, that 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 there's no eating pigs. Um, and he distinguishes between you can eat cow, but you can't eat pig because of how the hoofs were. Uh, the camel, no eating camel, um, uh, no, and and it gets into uh, shellfish, you know, no eating lobster. Um, I feel bad for them; it's one of my favorite foods. <laughs> uh, 
um, but certain birds, <laughs> <laughs> certain birds you could eat, certain birds you couldn't eat. Um, um, you, uh, it explains why John the Baptist could eat locusts, <laughs> but not beetles, <laughs> if you read through this. Okay, so there's a distinguishing. And not that any of these animals are bad. They're not bad, they're not sinful. Um, God created, every time God created something, he said it was good, right? And so it's, it's good, it's not, but for, for, and of course, there are probably some very specific, um, again, disease reasons for God declaring certain things uh, un, unedible and others, you know, and so again, you know, we're walking around the desert, do you really want to be eating shellfish? How often do we go to the sink and wash our hands and when we're cooking shellfish, right? So there probably was some protection from disease in these uh, things. Jeff was thinking um, that that things that ate things that were dead were not to be eaten. Um, so like pigs eat everything. They could eat dead things um, and they're, they can have parasites. And um, he was thinking, um, I think when it talks about certain birds, like you can't eat the raven, right? Well, the raven eats dead things. And so I think there's a better chance of, you know, um, acquiring disease from mm -hmm from that. Um, so, so of course, the diet, right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, again, you know, so some of it does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, for God, um, you know, to like look at each thing, I don't know that we can, you know, figure out why, you know, each creature a worm. I mean, I don't know that there's anything bad about eating worms. I don't know why you want to, but, <laughs> but for whatever reason, you know, God shows certain things to be set apart. I think the bigger picture is that certain things were to be clean and other things were to be unclean. Again, just demonstrating that contrast between the clean and the unclean, the pure and the impure, the holy, the holy and the not holy. Um, so, and that became a very big part of the Jewish culture to some sects of the Jewish, mm -hmm. it still is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we saw last year how, when, when remember when Peter went to the home of Cornelius? And he was very hungry. He was up on Cornelius's roof, and he fell asleep. He fell into a trance, and God um, opened heaven and brought down what looked like a sheet with all these different animals. And God told Peter, "Get up and eat." And what was Peter's response? Shut the front door! No way! Right? He was like, "Oh, am I allowed to say that? I'm sorry." <laughs> in, a, in, a, yeah. in a disrespectful way. But that was his, I mean, if you read it, God had to tell him three times, you can eat anything. Don't call something. And God says, don't call something I made uh, uh, clean, uh, unclean clean. You can eat everything now. And um, so, you know, I don't know about you guys, but to us, if I, I think, I think I could speak for you that if God appeared to you in a dream and told you something, it would just take one time, right? <laughs> but it demonstrated how ingrained in the culture, you know, Peter's like, I've never eaten anything unclean, you know, oh, oh, you know, that kind of thing. And again, you know, we, we saw that it was a big, we, it was a lot of our study last year was, uh, you know, that whole, you know, did the Gentiles have to become Jewish before they became Christians and they need to abide by the dietary laws and the sacrifices and, you know, and that kind of thing. And, you know, that was part of, you know, Jesus flipping everything upside down. And I read this this morning and I, again, I'm so glad we're studying Leviticus because I saw this for the first time. Um, I'm going to read Mark 7, 14 to 19 because I was look, looking for this verse, but then I, I saw something that I never saw attached to it. I was like, whoa. Um, um, again, Jesus called to the crowd and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. And then Jesus said, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it isn't for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. In saying this, this is what I didn't see before. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. So here Jesus is unraveling this whole system of dietary laws that they've set up that's so ingrained in their culture. And Jesus is like flipping it on its head. Um, so, you know, he was just, he was basically saying that, you know, it's not... You can't, nothing on the outside is what's going to make you defiled. The defiling is the sin on the inside in the heart. And it comes out of the mouth, out of the, 
you know, out of our mouths, our heart, the overflow of our hearts, our mouths speak. And so, so it's the sin that, that makes us unclean. It's, it's, it's a sinful, sinfulness in our hearts, really, that, that little, that rebellion, uh, that, that, that wages war within, uh, that what makes us unclean. And Jesus is, is using that, that, the, 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 the God's using the food here, um, to illustrate that true, uh, true unclean, clean, what true uncleanliness is. It's not really, you know, but the, but he, we need, we're dense, we need the physical picture of the spiritual reality, right? So God's choosing to use food for this time for these pe people to illustrate it. And again, another thing is, it's God's bigger purposes are looming, right? He's use, He used this dietary system to cocoon them, to insulate them, to, to prepare them for the Messiah. So, um, so um, if you became Jewish during this time, you had to give up your camel burgers. That's <laughs> the way it was. <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of fly through this. Um, chapter 12 and chapter 15 deals with purification after childbirth and, um, and after sex and after your monthly period. And... <laughs> <laughs> and um, and and these are good things. These are not again. It's not a sinful, you know, impurity that we think of. Uh, it's a ritual purity. These are good things. These are about life. God's all about life. God values life. Uh, these are life-giving things. God gave us uh, sex for our pleasure, for not just for you know uh, um, reproduction, 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 exactly, but re reproducing and populating, but also for our pleasure. And um, and our monthly period is all part of that. It's not a bad thing. Um, but again, we have a hard time understanding like rituals because we're not a ritual rich culture. I think I don't think we are. So it's kind of hard for us to to wrap, wrap our brains around. So if you read like. Uh, uh, like in chapter 12, you know, it talks about how, okay, the, the, the purity time for the man, for having a boy is half the time for a girl. And you're like, why is that? You know, the, you know, people, you know, like say, oh, what does he value? What does God value man, uh, males more than females? Well, no, actually he doesn't. God's neither male nor female. He values all of us the same. It, it's all, uh, 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 all, all of us are God's, uh, um, uh, God's I image, made an image, whether we're girl or boy. Uh, but interestingly enough, I was thinking about that, and I think, I think that um, there's like a lot of different, you know, theories as to why is the purification time for uh, having a daughter uh, double the time as a man. And I think, um, you know, maybe it's like twofold. <coughs> maybe it's because the 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 boy babies can be circumcised and again the circumcision was such an important uh, uh, symbol of the covenant between uh, man and God and and so you know maybe in that circumcision there was like a little extra little special blessing uh, for the boy um, but the the girl also could but it could also be that that the girl you know you know if you have have had daughters that there's the potential for when you're nursing uh, that your hormones can go into the into your daughter and then you know she can also bleed so um, I think that the extra time was given for you know that 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 allowance because again it was very very structured and very ritual. But in my silly thinking, as I thought, I thought about this, I'm thinking, well, let's see, double the recovery time for a daughter. If anybody, <laughs> I'm thinking, I know I think that's extra blessing for mom. <laughs> I don't know, it's just my stupid thinking. <laughs> so I would. Uh, uh, definitely consider all children a blessing, uh, girls or boys, and I believe God did too. Um, but again, these things seem strange to us. Why? Um, you know, why? Uh, and and, and um, he talks about uh, discharges, uh, normal discharges uh, from uh, our sexual organs and abnormal and what, what needed to happen. And again, the priest was the health department so there was a reason that if there was uh, there was a reason that there was time given and you had to make sure everything was normal um, because disease could spread you know very easily um, through through the camp um, um, and, but when I was thinking about this you know uh, like uh, the, the discharge from uh, a woman like with her monthly period and I thought you know, gosh, you know, how sad it would have been for, because uh, you're considered unclean during that time. And isn't it strange that, like, anything you touch is unclean? It's like, oh, boy, it passes to the stuff, to the things, the chairs and beds. And uh, and how sad for that woman uh, in the gospel uh, when we read um, uh, about the woman that bled for almost her entire adult life, right? Remember? And then she touched Jesus and she was healed. 
and how it gives you a greater appreciation because her whole life she was unclean. Her whole life she had to tell people, unclean, unclean. I mean, that gave you, a, you know, put a stigma on you, right? I mean, I would think, right? And for the first time, she was, God healed her. God, she was pure. She must have felt so much joy and happiness. And again, it's not that, you know, that her period made her unclean. Like, again, that's a physical picture of spiritual reality, right? It's our sin that makes us unclean. But we can have, we have that same joy when we first accept Jesus into our lives and we, we, we trust him as the Lord of our lives and, and find that forgiveness in him. You know, we just, we have that same joy and, and awesomeness of, uh, of, of being uh, a child of God and, and that we're clean now before God, which is, which is, uh, is awesome. And, and sometimes we have it right at that moment and sometimes it grows. Uh, sometimes we don't really understand it at first, but then we understand it later. And, uh, but we can all be so um, happy and joyful uh, because of Jesus and how he, he, he's cleansed us. Um, I was also thinking, and it's so funny because I'm like thinking about all these ex 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 examples with Jesus and I'm like, oh, this is so great that, you know, we're going to study the life of Jesus next year and hopefully in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because um, I just love how our studies do over the years. Don't they kind of like, like, like blend into each other? Like, it's so, so natural. I think when we study the life of Jesus, I think we're going to see things like uh, because we studied Leviticus. Like exactly. God's in control. <laughs> like God's in control. Awesome? <laughs> yes. We love it. <laughs> but I think because we study Leviticus, I think we're going to see more next year in the, when we study the life of Jesus. So I'm really excited. But you made me think of, too, when um, the, the friends uh, lowered the paralytic down the, through the roof, right? And what did Jesus do? I mean, they all expected this paralytic to be healed. And Jesus is like, okay, your sins are forgiven. And everybody's like, well, he's still on the mat. <laughs> and the the religious leaders are, how can he say he forget? You know, how can he say he forgives sin? Only God forgives sin. And so Jesus is like, all right, all right. Just so that you know that I have the authority to uh, forgive sin. Oh, by the way, because I'm God, <laughs> um, I'll just show you. And then get up and walk. And then he healed him. Um, but again, we're so we're a little dense, so we have to have that physical picture of spiritual reality. And I always just go back to Joel. You know, I used to tell him. No, Joel, because I, I know he he um, made a, a commitment to follow Jesus uh, and ask for his sins to be forgiven um, from uh, uh, when he was four. So he was very young. Um, but we would go out in public and people would stare and people would come up to us. Oh, I feel so bad for you. Uh, I feel so bad for him. And I'm thinking to myself, like, Joel's probably thinking, I feel bad for you. <laughs> because he had Jesus. He was whole. And and even though his body was broken, he he is... Uh, I think he's a, a physical picture of a spiritual reality that 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 sin, just like Joel's physical body was crippled, um, uh, sin cripples us, cripples our soul, right? Um, and I would tell, and and but Joel, because his soul was whole, you know, he 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 was whole. Um, that he he was good, he was okay, and that's why he would look at people and say, "Well, I think I feel bad for you um, if you don't have the Lord," kind of thing, because we would talk about how you know people. Everybody has something that they struggle with, and, and Joel, yours is more, uh, you know, obvious because it's on the outside. But some people have their um, brokenness on the inside. So, um, so again, we, um, I'm diverging. <laughs> so, uh, so again, we're, we're, we're looking at the, the, God's using the, 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 um, the dietary laws and the sexual discharges, <laughs> Healthy, unhealthy. <laughs> no, we got onto this. <laughs> to show that there's a difference between clean and unclean, pure and unpure, holy and, ho and unholy. Um, and Jesus, and He's showing us that. And what He did in His life is He He shows us that that only He can clean us, only He can um, bring holiness to our lives because um, uh, because of His sacrifice. Um, we're whole and holy because he's declared us whole and holy and he's placed his righteousness upon us. So, uh, so, uh, yes. So praise the Lord. We don't have to, we don't have to go through all these, uh, rituals and be ritually made clean. Um, because Jesus, our high priest in heaven has made us clean. Um, and again, you know, like I, I just thought of another example too. Uh, I'm diverging again, but when Jesus would heal somebody and he would say, go show yourself to the high priest. I didn't understand that until we studied Leviticus. Now I'm like, oh yeah, it's making sense. 
They needed that physical, yes, you're clean. Even though Jesus made them clean by forgiving their sins, you know, to, to go before the... And now we're getting it, right? It's like we're seeing this with, a, with, with new eyes here. Uh, so I think we're going to have a blast next year, too, because we've studied Leviticus. So, um, um, Okay, so we can come uh, to chapter 16. Sorry, I'm really flying through this. I'm so sorry. Um, the Day of Atonement. And again, because we, we saw last week the different sacrifices, I'm so excited that we could read through chapter 16 and we kind of know a little bit more what's going on. We have a little bit more of an awareness of what's going on. Um, but the Day of Atonement was a highlight for the Jewish uh, culture. So this was a huge day. It was a festive day, joyous day. This was a day when all the impurities of the, that the tabernacle collect that the, that the tabernacle collected throughout the year, all the sacrifices that were made, that in it, because it was sprinkled on the altar and the curtain, that the, the 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 tabernacle or God Himself had absorbed the impurities. Um, that this was the day that those impurities were going to be cleansed and washed out. Um, and this is how this is this is how God set it up. It was a very elaborate um, uh, ceremony. <clears throat> so we see, we see it starts with um, uh, Aaron, the high priest. This is the first. Oh, it, it is. By the way, it is the. Um, I think it's the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. So is that it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, still, still uh, held holy today by Jews. Um, so it's a huge ceremony, and we see the first. Uh, Day of Atonement um, celebrated here, uh, where Moses uh, presides. Moses is the mediator. I think, in a way, he's showing Aaron how to do it, so Aaron will be able to do it. Um, but it's it's very elaborate. It um, starts with Aaron being washed, the high priest being washed and dressed in a very ornate uh, outfit. Um, and again, we, we see as we read through it, everything had to be done exactly how God had commanded, right? Um, so, um, and we know, we, well, we're going to get to it in a few minutes, but we know that God means business because if we had done it in order, which might, might have been a prob, prob, mistake on my part, um, Aaron's sons, before we get here, they had already uh, done, not done something the way God commanded, and two of them were, um, were killed by God. So, um, so Aaron, um, I think as he went into this, um, he's probably like feeling the um, the weight of the passing of his sons and the weight of the responsibility of having to do everything perfect, perfectly the way God had had ordered, um, and then also um, being going from uh, being a normal person in cult in the society to being the high priest. Um, that must have been. Uh, a huge transition for him and a huge change in his thinking. Um, but again, everything had to be done. They had to be obedient to God. Everything had to be done as God had commanded. Um, so it started with the washing, um, the, the, the dressing. Um, then he was to offer a bull as his sin offering for him and his family. And this was the time when he was able to go beyond the curtain. So into the Holy of Holies. Only once a day were they able to do that. And I think you do. You do hear stories in the, in the future how they did tie the rope around them, yeah. mm -hmm. because if they didn't do everything to how God had commanded, they would be struck dead, and they'd have they couldn't go in there to get them. They'd be whoever went in would be struck dead. So they had to pull them out. Is that right, Helen? Is that that's what you've heard. heard. That's what I've heard too. Yeah. I haven't seen anything right now. To but we'll we'll we're gonna go through. You know, even as we go through numbers and as we go through Deuteronomy, maybe we'll we'll get some more insight because Deuteronomy kind of is is a, a recap of Leviticus, but it, with a little bit more detail. Um, so maybe we'll get it when we study um, De Deuteronomy together. Um, so he had to do the 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 sin offering with the bull for him and his family, and then he was able to go uh, beyond. He was supposed to go into the holy of holies beyond the curtain um, with the the bull's blood. Um, and he was to sprinkle it on the top of the ark, which again is the atonement, atonement cover. And like we talked about, uh, God was said to dwell above. And the reason the blood was put on there was because God was to, in theory, look down on the law 
the broken, um, the law that what we know, remember the Ten Commandments was put in the ark. So God was to look down on the law, the broken, but because, and the people, of course, had broken the law. That's why they had to do the, the ceremony. Um, but because God would not see the brokenness of the law, he'd see the blood covering. So that would then grant forgiveness and restoration from God's perspective uh, to, to the people. So that, I think that was the, the, the hope that the people had in doing this. Um, big ceremony. So he would go beyond the curtain, sprinkle it on the ark, the, the atonement cover. Um, they also had two goats for the people's sin. Uh, there was the goat that was um, slain for the sin offering for the people. And then Aaron was to do the same ritual as he did with the bull, go beyond the curtain, sprinkle the, the ark of the covenant, the top, the atonement cover, the atonement seat. And then, um, and then he was also to uh, and remember from studying yesterday with all these sacrifices, he was to lay his hands on the head of the animal. Again, the impurity was then to go onto the animal, into the blood. The blood was to take it um, and then be, be sprinkled. Um, he was also to, this is the day that he would do this also with the scapegoat, that he, there would be a live goat that Aaron would symbolically place the sins of the people on. And that goat was to be let out into the desert and to be, and the thought was that it would be driven as far out of camp as possible. Uh, if it came back to camp, it would be as if the sin was coming back on the people. And we didn't want, they didn't want that. So it was to be driven out. Um, and, you know, again, it just reminded me that you know, God forgives our sins, not from north to south, because there's an end there, right? But God says in, his, in Psalms that he forgives our sin as far as the east is from the west. There is no end to the One scarred distance, hand to the other. <laughs> right? God removes our sin as far as possible in eternity, uh, never to defile us again. He forgives our sins, past, present, and future, all of them. It's just, just, just so, so astounding. Um, uh, okay, so I get carried away and then I lose my place. <laughs> Um, so it's amazing. And, um, and again, so, so the Day of Atonement really offered to people the hope of forgiveness, the, 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 the feeling of being restored in a re right relationship with God. Um, again, and the fact that it was only until they sinned again, right? So it would have to all be done again. Uh, so, so again, we see that incompleteness until Jesus came. Um, but this is how God set it up, and this is all God's system to get them so that they would recognize the Messiah, receive the Messiah with joy, right, and follow him. Um, so it might seem strange to us, but um, then we're going to go back to 8. I'm going to go a little bit faster uh, for time. Um, so, um, oh, and the one thing I didn't say about the Day of Atonement, it's very interesting that this chapter... It's kind of in the middle of Leviticus, right? Because we have chapters one through fifteen that we're kind of we're, we've kind of been going through, and and also as we continue in seventeen to the end of Leviticus, um, it's kind of like um, again it's God's standard for holiness. Um, it's it's what makes a person ritually pure and ritually clean before God. Uh, not really clean, right? It's the blueprint. It's not the real thing. Jesus is the Jesus is the the real thing. This is the blueprint. But it's interesting that, again, the, the Day of Atonement, the chapter is stuck right kind of close to the middle of Leviticus, and I think it was to show the importance of uh, of this day, that and, 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 the, and that the people would have hope of forgiveness and have hope of being reconciled with God, um, and that God would be giving them another chance to follow him. And again, God's love poured out to them that he Oh, um, I'm going to get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so we'll go back to chapter 8. <laughs> and I hope this uh, I hope this is good. So um, we go back to chapter 8. And, and this was, uh, okay, after we talked about the sacrifices, all the different uh, offerings that were to be made, um, they had an ordination ceremony uh, for Aaron to be anointed as the high priest and his sons to be priests. And again, you know, Moses mediated this um, to demonstrate, I think, how he was... Aaron was supposed to take the reins and, and run with it, but um, Moses performed the ceremony. It involved washing, again, symbolic of, of Jesus washing away our sin. We are now clean before God. Uh, it include, uh, involved Aaron being dressed in elaborate clothes. Um, again, that clothing, you know, representing his new status, that he is the high priest. Um, 
And um, and again, you know, we scripture talks about us when we are in Christ, we are clothed with Christ's righteousness. God covers us with the robe of Jesus, uh, Jesus' righteousness upon us. And, uh, you know, kind of made me think like, <laughs> like it's so much better than any clothing we, that and, and that this world has to offer any clothing any watch out model runways right we're coming through <laughs> soon to have our new bodies <laughs> when we get to heaven right <laughs> um so um it involved clothing again symbolic of our, us being clothed in christ's righteousness and also involved anointing of the holy spirit again um symbolic of oh, anointing with oil which oil is frequently uh, symbolic of the holy spirit it said it had to be done exactly. They had to be obedient to God. It had to be done exactly how He said. And then in chapter nine, um, they they perform the they performed the, uh, the sacrifices to anoint uh, uh, to commission Aaron and his sons. And then God did something amazing. Uh, verse uh, in chapter nine, verse twenty three. Moses and Aaron went into the tents of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw this, they shouted for joy and fell face down. And again, this is happening at a time where they've already blown it. They they didn't take them that long to build that, the fashion that cow, calf did, that, that golden calf to worship, right? But they've already screwed up. And yet here, God, by sending out that fire, it showed that God accepted their sacrifice, that God, uh, that, that God's, uh, love and forgiveness um, for their sins and um, his God's desire to uh, to dwell with them uh, was made real through that fire. Um, so again, for anybody that says, I don't like the God of the Old Testament, God's love and forgiveness and mercy pour down on the people right here in Leviticus of all places. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and then chapter 10, we see the sadness where they did not, the Aaron's sons did not, uh, obey God and to the two it says that um, I think it's the verse very first verse in chapter 10 Aaron's sons uh, Nadab and Abihu took I can't I'm, I'm sure I butchered this no pun intended took their censers and put them and added incense and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord so I mean did they get the fire from a different place other than I think they were supposed to get it from the altar did they get it from a um, a different place um, did they I think all theories have been blown, thrown around were they drunk when they did it did they do it at the wrong time um, we don't know but they just they certainly we do know they didn't do it as God has had commanded and God uh, unfortunately uh, took their lives from them um, so the principle here is that uh, priests have tremendous privilege um, to lead the people and to lead the people into intimacy with with God. Um, it is um, priests have a tremendous potential to have a great intimacy with the Lord themselves, and yet with great privilege comes great responsibility. They could bring blessing upon the people. They could also bring uh, punishment upon the people. And Luke. 1248 I'm going to paraphrase Jesus says to uh, who've been given much much is going to be be expected and so it kind of makes me think that um, that we in America we've been given so much you know I was thinking about one of the things Dorinda prayed last week um, about our brothers and sisters in the Middle East um, that don't have the freedoms that we have and really it is that whole 1040 window right uh, all across North Africa and the Middle East and right into communist China you know, it's that, that intense, hideous suffering that our brothers and sisters face. Uh, it costs them to follow Christ there. Um, they could be excommunicated from their families. They can lose their jobs. They lose their livelihoods. They can be thrown in jail, tortured, even killed. Um, and we know that we know that from studying Revelation, the martyrs, those that have pers been persecuted for their faith, have a special place around the throne uh, when we are in eternity with the Lord. And they deserve it, rightfully so. Um, um, but we, al we, 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 we also talk about women's issues in our culture, and it's, we got to elevate this beyond elephants and donkeys. <laughs> we got to heal the divide because women in this part of the world, in that 1040 window, are seriously abused, right? Um, they're divorced, um, they're raped, um, they have body parts cut out of them, uh, 
for no other reason that you know maybe they looked at somebody wrong or whatever men and there is no accountability um, uh, they truly women in that part of the world truly have no voice um, we think about our culture and how much we have um, physically uh, we have a lot of food right um, many of us are hungry because we're on diets right because <laughs> we have so much um, and yet um, you know we are so blessed to live here and yet you know people in um, in Africa, there are children in Africa, children in South America, uh, the Pacific, um, that are, are starving to death, literally. And um, and we've been given so much, um, and not just physically, I think we've been given so much spiritually, right? With our freedoms to worship, we have uh, so much to be thankful for that we can come and study the Bible uh, without fear of, are the is the government going to come in? Um, so I think with this awesome blessings that God has given us, uh, we have tremendous uh, potential to be a blessing to other people uh, in the world. Um, that um, we can bless uh, physically and spiritually people that, that, that need to. We can live forgiven and free and joyful, even in our suffering, right? To be a hope to people that have no hope, right? I feel so bad. I talk to a friend all the time that... No hope, uh, uh, and, and, and her brother's sick, and he's going to die, and it, every time she talks about him, tears in her eyes, uh, I, I just, my heart goes out uh, to her, but he's got no, no, there's no, no hope there, right? So we need to live, uh, 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 live uh, God's love and life to people that really, really, really need it. Um, because we are loved, we are adored, we are treasured. We are treasured by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Um, so people need to know that hope um, that we have in Christ, right? Um, and sometimes, um, you know, and there's so many people that are hurting all over the world. Um, they're hungry and they're hurting, and and sometimes it's physical, and 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 sometimes they can't uh, experience the love and forgiveness of God because that physical hurt or that physical uh, hunger is so intense, right? They can't see Christ. So we can be a blessing. Uh, it's so good to, to sponsor a child in another country, that you give them uh, food and clothing and school, you give them a life, a potential for life. Um, and it's so good to, to, to support things like, uh, we were just watching a big infomercial, I think we watched for like two hours on Mercy Ships, and we're like, they have these ships that like, get, pulled into ports of um, third world nations. And, and the thought was that um, uh, it was easier to bring the uh, equipment and the volunteers, the volunteer surgeons, nurses, um, therapists, they, it was easier to bring them into ports um, through this big ship. And they bring people on the ship and they give life-saving surgeries. And, um, and again, all in the name of Jesus, um, to hopefully to get uh, to to get uh, people to a point where they can they can hear the gospel right they can hear and experience God's love and forgiveness it's awesome um, and I keep telling my kids you know I just think oh gosh my kids are, are are very spoiled they keep I don't like that food I don't like that dinner I don't like your lunch why did you not eat your lunch I don't like what you gave me and I'm like I'm like I they think I'm teasing I am taking them to Zimbabwe because <laughs> they need to be rocked out of their teenage self-absorption, right? Mm. There's nothing that gets us out of ourselves more than helping other people, right? And I want my kids, they think I'm teasing, but I'm really not. I'm praying, God, please send us, <laughs> send us to Africa. <laughs> um, I want them, and I know it's going to be life-changing for them, and it's going to hurt, but it's going to be good. Um, because what we do in this life matters. You know, we have the tremendous um, potential to be a blessing, and not just physically, Right? Not just physically, right? Some people are hurting emotionally. Some people are hurting and hungry emotionally, right? And Jesus sat satisfies. Only Jesus can satisfy, right? But sometimes they can't see God's love and forgiveness because the emotional hurt is so strong and so intense, right? And so that's why what's one of the reasons we do what we do. Because you know, one of Jeff's motto is just one more. Just want he wants to help one more family, one more family, one more family. Um, with the hope of bringing wholeness and um, uh, healing, and hopefully hope. Um, hopefully, I mean, of course, we want them to have a good life here, uh, but hopefully the hope would be that they would have assurance, hope, assurance of 
where they will go when they pass away, that they will have assurance in their eternal home. So, so it matters, it matters. So again, we are very excited to live in this part of the world at this time because again, we've been given so much and God calls us that we are all priests. We all have the privilege, whether we work for a church or not, we are all priests. We are all part of the royal priesthood that God has. We have tremendous potential to be a blessing, to bring a blessing to others. Um, um, and we don't want to squander that, right? We don't want to squander this time. Uh, uh, we want God to say, when we